Tonight we will conclude the book of Judges. So we'll get from chapter 19 all the way to chapter 21. It's one of those stories that's kind of hard to break up without uh, revisiting the whole story again next time. So we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to try to cover some ground tonight. And after we're, we're, we have um, Afterglow tonight, that, that's when we just have an opportunity to wait on the Lord together. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of close out the service, I'm, I'm hoping by 8.15 or so. And then if you need to grab your children, you're welcome to come back in. Um, we just, we're going to be here for a half hour, 45 minutes, just, just worshiping the Lord together and waiting on the Lord and maybe uh, just hoping, praying that, uh, that he would show up and maybe some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit would be exercised. That's, that's our desire. It's just open to the Lord. God, what do you want to do? And so we're going we're gonna to have that opportunity tonight uh, after service. And if you're, we invite you, welcome you to, to st- hang out with us and seek the Lord together. So uh, we'll, we'll be doing that afterwards. Judges chapter 19. Now, if, if you remember chapter 17 and chapter 18, the last time we were together on a, on a Wednesday, it's been a couple weeks since uh, we had our Thanksgiving service and then I was out in, in the jungles of Peru for a week. Uh, we're, we've kind of missed a couple weeks, but let me, let me just refresh your memory. Judges, when we finished chapter 16, really ended kind of the chronological order of the book of Judges. Chapter 17, or uh, yeah, 17, 18, and now 19 through 21, it's given us a snapshot of what was happening in the nation of Israel at this particular time in history. And so it's not so much chronological, but more of a, a moral picture for us of the state of the nation and, and what was happening inside the nation of Israel during this time as the children of Israel had come into the promised land, they had settled into the promised land, they had become very prosperous as they were occupying houses that they didn't build they had vineyards and 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 all kinds of uh you know fields that they never planted but they were now reaping the benefits of them because God had given them this land and as they had become comfortable what had happened is they become very uh, morally um lax I titled the message, No Moral Compass, because you're going to see how that plays out in chapter 19 through chapter 21, is that we have a glimpse of this nation who had really uh, forsaken God, they had forsaken his word, they had forsaken um, any, any kind of, of, of biblical um, direction for their life, and then you see the results of it. And we're, we're going to take a look at that tonight. If you remember back in Judges chapter 2, verse 10, it kind of gave us the, the, the whole picture. It says in Judges 2, 10, it says, when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them, check this out, who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done in Israel. So this generation that had come in died off. The next generation is now alive, and they're the ones that are the leaders. They're the ones that are the, 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 the movers and shakers in the, in, the, in the culture there. And what had happened is that they didn't know the Lord. They had, they had no understanding of who God was in their own life. And it's, you know, it, that's, it's, it's just one generation away. I mean, just think about our generation now, guys. You know, one generation, if our children don't grasp the word of God and don't have a relationship with the Lord, you know, we can find our nation in the very same place that the nation of Israel was. And I think we're very close to that. That, you know, we're watching just a, a, a breakdown in the moral fiber of a nation because no one's willing to uh, take the word of God for the direction for life. And so we're watching you know, all of these things take place. What's interesting is you, as you go to chapter 19, it reminds us again uh, in verse one, it says, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. 
He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem and Judah, but his concubine, his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there for four months. And here's the introduction of, of what's, what's happening. There was no king in Israel. You see, the king represented uh, someone had, who had authority and who would point the people either toward God or away from God, but now there was no one to do any of that. And so they were all doing what was right in their own eyes. We had found that, that, that actual thought in Judges 17, 6. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So everyone just going like, you know, it, it's, it's more of a... a, a a mindset that you do whatever you want to do and I'll do whatever I want to do and there's no real right, there's no real wrong, there's no real truth, there's no real error, just whatever feels good to you, you just do it. And that was the state of the nation of Israel. It's relativism. And that, that means that everything's just relative. It could, you know, however you were brought up, whatever you believe, that's true and that's right. And there was no one to stand up and say, wait a second, this is what God says. And this is what God declares. And this is what, what right is from God, the creator of heaven and earth. It's perspective. And so that everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. Now, we, we come to another story about a Levite. If, it was, if you remember back in chapter 17 and 18, it was a Levite who had become the priest for this man, Micah, and, and it was all unbiblical what he was doing. And we find another situation, it's another Levite, and what that declares to us is that even those who were supposed to be the religious people and the spiritual people had declined, had, who had failed, because he's taken a concubine. A concubine was like a, a second wife. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, that, that, that was his side chick. That was the gal that, you know, he got his pleasure from. And, and so his wife was there to raise his children, to, to take care of the family, you know, uh, and, and the, the, the responsibilities of the household. The concubine was where he got his pleasure from. That, that, that's how they, and, and a Levi is taking another woman now. Okay, so, so you kind of get the moral state of, of the nation. Here's supposed to be the spiritual leader, and he's now taking on a second wife, per se. The second wife, it says she played the harlot, that, that she left him, she was out with other men, and she ends up back in her dad's house. And so he decides that he's going to go back and try to make things right with her. And, and, and that, that's where we're at in the story. Look at verse 3. The husband arose. He went after her to speak kindly to her and to bring her back. Having his servant and couple of donkeys with him, he, he brought him into her father's house. She brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, stayed with him three days. They ate, drank, and they lodged there. And it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning. He stood to depart, but the young, man's, young woman's father said to his son-in-law, refresh your heart with the morsel of bread and afterwards go your way. So they sat down. The two of them ate, drank together. The young woman's father said to the man, please be content to stay all night and they let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, so he lodged there again, and he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young woman's father said, please refresh your heart, so they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. Now, you know, I, I don't know what, what's going on here, but the guy can't get out of there. The father-in-law kept going, no, no, just kick back, you know, he'll enjoy your company, just stay a little bit longer, just have one more meal. Now, hospitality in that culture was everything. Someone came into your house, you, you wanted to, uh, you know, treat them with, with dignity, you wanted to bless them with, 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 you know, comfort, and this guy couldn't get out of his father-in-law's house, and, and I, I don't know, you know, what his concubine was thinking of all of this, but he couldn't get out. Every day, he would try to get out, and she would go, you know, hey, just kick back, have another meal. Drink a little bit. That's, that's just, you know, and, and so now they're going on the fifth day and this guy's at the point where he's going, man, I got to get out of here. This guy's going to keep me here forever. And so notice what happens. They sat down. The two of them ate, drank together. The young woman's father said to him, be content, stay all night. 
Your heart be merry. And the man stood to depart. Oh, I'm sorry. Jump down to verse 9. I was reading that. I mean, we've already got so many departings, and I'm reading it again. Look at verse 9. And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day's now drawing toward evening. Please, spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go away early so that you may get home. And however, the man was not willing to spend the night. So he arose, departed, came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem, with him were the two saddled donkeys, his concubine with him. They were near Jubas, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, come, please let us turn aside into the city of the Jubasites and lodge in it. Now, at that time, the Jubasites were the ones who had control of Jerusalem, which were not part of Israel. They weren't part of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so they would have been the foreigners. They would have been the, 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 the heathen. They would have been the pagans. They would have been the Gentiles that were in the land. And the Jubasites were in Jerusalem, and they're passing by Jerusalem. And, the, and, and he's going, hey, let's just lodge here tonight. It was only five miles from Bethlehem where they were. And no, notice the response from uh, the Levite. He says, his master said to him, we will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who are not the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servants, come, let us draw near to one of these places, spend the night in Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed by and they went their way. The sun went down as they got near to Gibeah, which belonged to Benjamin. Now, Benjamin's one of the tribes of Israel. And he turned aside there to go into lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Now, now remember, this is a culture where hospitality was everything. You would go to the, there wasn't a holiday inn. You couldn't just go, you know, to Motel 6 and say, hey, is there a room tonight? That, that wasn't how it worked in that culture. What, what, you would go to the open square. Someone would see you in the open square. Hey, you know what? Come and lodge in my house tonight. We'll take care of you. We'll take care of all of your needs. You know, you, we'll, we'll, it, it, hospitality was, was something that was uh, honorable. It was something that uh, any city would, um, would embrace of the children of Israel. But they go into the city and no one invites them in. No one comes and says, hey, come and lodge with us. We'll take care of you. He says, and it was getting late. Now it's nighttime. They're thinking we're just going to sleep out here in the open square. And verse 16, just then an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, where are you going and where do you come from? He says, we're passing from Bethlehem to Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there and I went to Bethlehem to Judah. Now I'm going to the house of the Lord, but there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkey and bread and wine for myself and for your female servants and for the young man who is your servant, there is no lack of anything. He goes, look, I, we got all of our needs met. It's not, we're not going to be a burden on anybody. I got everything we need. You know, we, we just looking for a place to, to Safe to sleep. That's really what, he, what he's declaring. The old man sees them, and no, notice they, they were from the same city. And he says, look, peace be with you. Let your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. He brought him into his house. He gave fodder to the donkey, and they washed their feet. They ate, and they drank. Now, this old man, we don't know his name, but he was being very hospitable. But... And here's, here's, here's the crazy part. Watch this. Look at verse 22. And when they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house. They beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him cardinally. Now, guys, this, this is the crazy thing. This is the same scenario that happened in Sodom before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And really what, it, what I, I think is striking as you're looking at this, these are supposed to be the children of Israel. But the problem with the children of Israel is that they had forsaken the law of God and they had no longer had any kind of compass in their life. And man without a compass totally degenerates into something perverse. We, left to ourselves, we, we will go continue to spiral down a very immoral, a very perverse lifestyle. And, and God's word is, is, is what sets the standard. It, it, it's what gives us the, 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 the right direction for a person's life. And what's, what happens is when a nation begins to, to forsake truth and forsake God, that nation becomes more and more immoral. And we're watching that play out in our nation. It's nothing new. It's happened throughout the centuries. It happens from the beginning of time. And every time man decides that we don't have to obey God or we don't want to hear what God has to say, we're going to do everything, whatever's right in our own eyes, and then we just continue this, this digression in our life. But what's, this is what's heavy. They're saying, you know what? There, were, there was a woman there. They said, we don't want the woman. We want the man. It's homosexuality. They wanted to have homosexual relationships with the man that had come into the town. And this is what's heavy. Check this out. But the man, the master of the house, verse 23, went out to them and he said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man is coming to my house, do not commit this outrage. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let them, let me bring them out now. Humble them, do to them as you please, but to this man do not do such a vile thing. And you're just like, what in the world? What dad would come and say, you know what, I got a daughter. She's never known a man. She's a virgin. You know what, take her and do whatever you want with her all night long. Just don't mess with this man. Here's a concubine. Here's take his, his, his second wife. She, you know, she really has no value. You know, take her and, and, and do, with her, do with her as you please, but leave the man alone. I mean, I mean th think about how perverse the culture had become. And, and what, what's, what's incredible is in, in that culture, guys, women were treated as property. That, that, I mean, really... You know, we, we look at that and go, man, that's, that's disgusting. Well, who would do that or why would that? We're going to find out that this woman, they, they abuse her all night long and they leave her for dead. And you go, man, the, I mean, what kind of culture was that? You know, let, 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 me, let me tell you, it's the same kind of culture we're living in today. It's not any different. Oh, you and I might be sheltered from some of that, but, but think, think about what's going on uh, in, in Nigeria with, with, with Boko Haram. They take the women, they... they they go into schools and they'll, they'll take 250, 125 girls and they'll just take them and they'll become sex slaves. And they'll, they'll, they'll abuse them until they die. They, they, have, they have no value in, in the religion of Islam. We, we've seen that uh, in, in, in um, what was it, the, the, the Yazadi girls that, that were taken as sex slaves by ISIS and, and that whole group. And they, they, they would, they would they, 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 there was instances of them burning them alive because they wouldn't perform what they wanted them to perform sexually. We're, we're, we're living, it's not, you know, we, we see murder and rape and all of these things in, in our big cities, you know, right, right around us. You know, we sit there and go, oh, how vile, how ugly, that's, that's disgusting. No, it, it's happening today. It's not something that would just happen in then. The same kind of vileness, the same kind of immorality. You know, the Taliban in, in, in Afghanistan, man, you know, rape, trade, kill. I mean, they, you know, just they, the, the way they treat women. Let me tell you something. The gospel is what elevated women. Because God says that all of us are equal in his eyes. It's, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that brought women to the place where we're saying, hey, it's not male or female, it's not, it's, it's not color, it's, it's, it, we're all precious in the eyes of God. And we all have the same value in the eyes of God. It's, it's Christ that elevates man and elevates women. 
And what's, what's incredible is that they had punted when it come to moral truth, therefore just the, the decline of mora- immorality just continued to increase. And every time that we decline in moral truth, if they think about it, we, we, we go, oh, we, everything, you know, America, we got, no, it's this, you know what the sex slave uh, business in America is, is astronomical? Elevating women, really? You, 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 want, you want to talk about pornography and how many women are being abused in, in, in that whole realm of pornography? It's, it's unreal what's going on. I, I was reading an article, I, I think it's six women just in the last few months have committed suicide and they, they, were, they were porn stars because they just couldn't handle the, 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 the guilt and the shame of what all that brought upon their lives. And so, you know, we, we, it's really easy for us to look at a story like this and go, oh, that, that's so, so horrible. It is horrible, but it's happening right now. It's horrible what's happening in our, in our nation, what's happening in the world. And, and without God, man, th- this, this, is, this is where man goes. And, and what Judges is telling us, look how immoral even the nation of Israel had become when there was no compass for their life. No, notice, notice the rest of the story, man. They... they, they It tells us there in um, verse 25, but the man would not heed him. So the man took his concubine, brought her out to them and they knew her and they abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. And the woman came as the day was dawning, fell down at the door of the man's house where his master was till it was light. And the master arose in the morning, opened the door of the house and went out to go his way. And there was, a, there was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hand on the threshold. And he said to her, get up, let's get going. This is the Levite. I mean, you know, not, no compassion. All right, woman, let's go. <laughs> but there was no answer. So the man lifted her and onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his place. And when he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her through all the territory of Israel. And so it was all who saw it said no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel have come in from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. Wow. Now, guys, understand something. You know, before we go any further, God's not condoning any of this. I mean, I think it's important to, to, to like, God is just telling reality. This is what was happening. God, God's not going, he approved of it, God, of any of it. God, God isn't saying that this was a good thing. What he's saying is, is that this, this is what was happening in that day and he's giving us the account of what had happened. And that's what I'm, blows my mind about the scripture and the Bible, man, is that God never, uh, you know, soft pedals it. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't try to make it look better than it is. He just tells us this is what it was. And he says, here's what had happened. This guy took, he, the, the woman was dead. He threw on her donkey, took her home and he cut her into 12 pieces and he sent her to all of the tribes of Israel and said, look what happened to my wife, to my concubine in Israel. Can you even believe this? How wicked. Now, chapter 20 is the response of the nation. And, and this is a heavy chapter because now, you know, we, we got the story. This is how it went down. This, this woman was raped to death. She, she, she was brought home and she was dismembered and she was sent to the 12 tribes so that they would have a visual. Look, look, look what the, the tribe of Benjamin, the people of Gibeah did to this woman. And so now the children of Israel, chapter 20, All the children of Israel came out from Dan to Beersheba as well as from the land of Gilead and the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah and the leaders of the people, all the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of people of God. 
400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. And the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. And the children of Israel said, tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? And the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered and said, my concubine and I went up to Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. The men of Gibeah rose against me, surrounded the house at night because of me. They intended to kill me, but I instead, but instead they ravished my concubine so that she died. So I told, I took hold of my concubine, cut her in pieces, sent her throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. Look, all of you are children of Israel. Give your advice and give your counsel here and now. And all the people arose as one man saying, none of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do in Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. We will take 10 men out of every hundred throughout the tribes of Israel, a hundred every thousand and a thousand of every 10,000 to make provisions for the people when they come to Gibeah and Benjamin that they may repay all the vileness that they have done in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city united together as one man now here, here here was the deal there was Gibeah was part of the tribe of Benjamin and it was only one city of Benjamin and so they all gather together and they're going man th th this has to be confronted we can't just turn the other cheek we can't just pretend it never happened we're going to go and we're going to confront this situation and they said what we're going to do is we're going to one out of every hundred of us, or 10 out of every hundred, one out of every 10, 10 out of every hundred, 100 out of every thousand are gonna be supplying the food for those that are gonna go into battle against these people. And so they were saying, we're all in. We're, we're gonna take care of the financial need to, you know, to feed everybody. We're, 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 gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna go in there. We're, we're gonna take care of business because this is something wicked that can't be overlooked. So the children of Israel gather together it tells us in verse 12, the tribe of Israel sent men through the tribe of Benjamin saying, this, what is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Now therefore deliver up the men, the perverted men who are in Gibeah that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. Instead, the children of Benjamin gathered from the cities of Gibeah to go to battle against the children of Israel. Now this is, this is what's heavy, guys, and as you're, as you're reading this whole picture, Rather than siding with the children of Israel against the city of Gibeah where the Benjamites were, the rest of Benjamin decided, you know what, we're going to fight against you guys. We're going to stand with the people of Gibeah rather than stand against the evil that they did. Now, now here's, 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 here's something that I, I think really needs to be kind of thought out in our own life, in our own uh, you know, perspective is that you, you all of us got to decide, man, am I going to stand on the side of God and what he says, or am I going to stand on the side of uh, family, friends, neighbors, you know, really, you know, whose side am I going to take when it comes to uh, truth? Because we're, we're living in a culture where everybody wants to be accepted. And if you don't agree with me, then, you know, then, then, then you're my enemy, right? And, and, and the reality is, is that so many in our culture just say, hey, you know what? It's okay to do whatever you want to do. No big deal. And you, no one's willing to stand against sin anymore. How many of us are really willing to stand again and take a stand and say, you know what? Th what, what that is, is sin. Sexual morality, it's sin. I don't care how you slice it. It's sin. You, you want to have a sexual relationship outside of marriage, the Bible calls it fornication. And fornication, God calls sin. Homosexuality, God calls it sin. There's, there, there's, you, you, there's no other way to slice it. There's no other way to dice it, man. You, it's, either, it's either God declares this or he doesn't declare. And what does God declare? And then you got to decide whose side am I going to take? God's side or man's side? Am I going to send it aside of truth or am I going to send it aside of error? 
Because understand something, man. You're not fighting against man. You're fighting against God. You're in disagreement, not with man, but you're in disagreement with what God says. That's heavy. Watch, I, I want you to t- turn here. It, it's heavy because then last night I was sharing with the men and it's almost like the, I'm going, man, this is the same message. Because God's always asking us, man, you know, to choose a side that we're gonna take. I want you to turn to Romans chapter one with me. Check this out. This is a heavy chapter. Because Romans chapter one is talking about the wrath of God. And it's talking about, you know, really what God approves of and what God disapproves of. Now notice, notice verse 28 of chapter one. And, and well, let's just read it. Verse 28, Romans chapter one, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to what? A debased mind. To do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness and sexual immorality and wickedness and covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and evildoers. They are whisperers and backbiters and haters of God and violent and proud and boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to their parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Look at this. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Wow. If this is the lifestyle that you're going to live, he says, this is what you got coming. It's death. And when he's talking about death, he's not talking about the physical death, guys. He's talking about a spiritual death. Death, separation from God, man, for all eternity. That's what death spiritually is. And then, here's, here's the heavy part. And I think here's where it ties into what we're talking about in Gibeah. It says, look at, look at the end of that. Not only those who do the same, only the people who practice those things, but also those who approve of those who practice them. Wow. You approve of the evil, even though you're not doing it, but you're approving of it, you're just as guilty as the people doing it. And that's what Gibeah was doing. That, that's what the people of Benjamin were doing with Gibeah. You know what, we, we, we're, we're not doing that, but you know what, we're gonna fight with them for it. And not, it wasn't just the whole idea that, that they were doing those things, it was the idea that they were approving of the things they were doing by standing with them in this fight. And so, man, there's a consequence for it. And watch what happens. Verse 15. And from the cities at that time, the children of Benjamin numbered 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who numbered 700 select men. Among this, all these people were 700 select men who were left-handed. Everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. And the, the, these guys were incredible uh, slingers. <laughs> they, to, to, they, they can sling a stone. They, they, you know, they, they, what, what, it was kind of like what you call a slingshot, but they would do it with, you know, they do it with a, with a leather and they would twirl it and they would throw it. And it says these, these guys could hit their target within a hair's breadth. I mean, that, that's pretty accurate. These, these guys are sharpshooters. <laughs> they, 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 were, they were very skilled and they were left-handed guys. So, you know, they, 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 I, I don't know. We, we, got some, we got some interesting information here. <laughs> no, no, notice what happens. It says instead... Uh, 700 select men, left-handed, everyone could sling a stone at a hair's breadth and not miss. Now, besides Benjamin, the men of Israel numbered 400,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were men of war. And the children of Israel arose and they went into the house of God to inquire of God. And they said, which of us should go first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And the Lord said, Judah first. And the children of Israel rose in the morning, they encamped against Gibeah, and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin, and the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against the Gibeon, and the children of Benjamin became, uh, came out to Gibeah, 
On that day, cut down to the ground 22,000 men of Israel and the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves again. They formed a battle line in the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. And the children of Israel went up and they wept before the Lord. Now here's what's interesting, man. Benjamin wipes out 22,000 of Israel. You're going, what happened? Why, what's up with that? I, I, I thought... They went and they said, God, which of us should go up first? And here, here's what's interesting, man. These guys never inquired of the Lord, should we go? They, they, they gave God two options. They, they didn't give God any options. God, which one, which one, do, which one are, of us are supposed to go? And God goes, okay, you want to go? Go, Judah. And Judah goes and 22,000 men die. And guys, I, I, I think there's something here for us because we're going to watch this play out another time. We'll, we'll come back to it. Watch what happens. The children of Israel went up. They wept before the Lord, verse 23, until evening. And they asked counsel of the Lord saying, shall I again draw near for the battle against the children of my brethren, Benjamin? And the Lord said, go up against them. And the children of Israel approached the children of Benjamin on the second day, and Benjamin went out again against them from Gibeah on the second day, and they cut to the ground 18,000 more of the children of Israel as they drew the sword. No, this time they go, hey, Lord, um, you know, we, 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 got, we got wiped out last time. Shall we go up against them now? Against our brethren? And, and you know, I, I think they're, they're now kind of becoming a little more spiritually astute, you know, astute. They're just kind of going, hey, um, should we go up against them? And God goes, you guys want to go? Go. Here's the heavy part. Look at the next verse, and, and I think here's where everything kind of ties together. Look, look at verse 26. And the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and they came to the house of God and they wept. Check this out. They sat there before the Lord and they fasted. And that day, fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Now, now, they're meaning business. Before they came to God and they're saying, God, tell us what, you know, should we go up? Who should go first? And then and they kind of, God goes, Send someone, Judah, go for it. There, 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 there was, they didn't approach God with, with any kind of reverence. You see, sacrifices was the idea that I'm offering myself to you, God. The Romans tells us this, that we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service. And then we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed, how? By the renewing of our minds so we can prove what is the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God. And what's happening here is that the children, the children of Israel, they come the first time and going, Lord, which of us should go? We're gonna go kill them. We're gonna do what's right. But they weren't even doing what was right themselves. Hey God, should we go up against these guys? Yeah, go for it. 18,000 more die. Now they come back and now they're broken. And now they're weeping. Now they're fasting. And then they bring a sacrifice and a sacrifice is the idea that I'm offering up myself to the Lord. And then they bring a peace offering. And guys, here's the deal, man. The only way that you and I can have peace with God is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. He's the perfect sacrifice and he's the one that brings the peace between us and God. And without the sacrifice and without the peace between us and God, there's no way that we, you and I can commune in fellowship with a holy God. Matter of fact, it tells us in, in the book of Hebrews, it says that we're to come boldly to the throne of grace. That's, that's the throne room of God. We're to come boldly to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us. You see, 
without the sacrifice, without the blood of Christ, you and I don't have access to God. We can't have relationship. We can't have fellowship. You, you and I are, are so distant from God because of sin that we, we can't even come into his presence unless the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. And finally, they bring the sacrifice, and finally, they, now there's peace between them and God. And then notice what happens next. The children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days, and Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go to battle against the children of my brethren Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hands. Now God is, what? God is giving them instruction. I'm going to deliver them tomorrow to you, because you approached me the way I declared for you to approach me. Now you have access to me because, because now you've, you've offered up the sacrifice that you were supposed to offer up in order to have access to me. And it's heavy because, you know, th think about this, guys. You know, how many of us, you know, can go to God when we're in trouble and, oh, God, I need your help, I need your help. And then, it, it, the, the, you know, we, 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 don't even, we don't even have a relationship with him. We, it, it just, and then, and then we go, oh, God wasn't there, or God didn't hear me, or God, you know, because you, 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 weren't, you didn't offer yourself. You, you didn't come, you know, the way that, you, as a broken man, a broken woman, saying, God, I'm done, I'm done, I can't do this anymore. I need the blood of Jesus to cleanse me. I, 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 need, I need my life to be changed. It, this, this isn't just some, some uh, you know, ritual that you go through if, if, if I go and ask God then God's gonna no no God God's looking for a broken man a broken woman a surrendered life where you come and you say okay God I'm done trying to do this on my own I I I, I, I offer everything to you I every time I hear someone say well I tried God and he didn't work that irritates me God isn't like some piece of clothing I tried him on and he didn't fit. No, you surrender to him. You realize that I, I, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. I, I, without God, I'm doomed. And the only thing I can do is, is, is just humble myself and say, God, I can't do this without you. And that's when business can take place. And the children of Israel just try, try, they try to surface this the whole thing. And, and how many people just try to surface this relationship with God, but it's not until we come to him the way he prescribes. God, I, I, I offer up my life. I surrender it all to you. I'm a living sacrifice. I want to live holy now. I want to be, I want to be someone that, 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 is, that is radically following what you say. Now we can do business. And, and, and then at this point, watch what happens. And the Lord said, go up tomorrow, I'll deliver them into your hand. And Israel set men in ambush on the, uh, and all around Gibeah. The children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day. They put themselves in battle array against Gibeah as other times. So the children of Benjamin went out against the people. And they were drawn away from the city. They began to, stroke, to strike down and kill some of the people and at that other, as, as, as is other times in the highways. And the group... Uh, one, uh, uh, one of which goes up to Bethel and the other to Gibeah and in the field about 30 men of Israel and the children of Benjamin said, We're defeated be be they are defeated before us as at first. And the children of Israel said, Let us flee and draw them away from the city to the highway. So all the men of Israel rose from the place. They put themselves in battle array in Bel Tamar. And Israel men in ambush burst forth from the, their position in the plain of Gibeah. And 10,000 select men from all Israel came against Gibeah. The battle was fierce. The Benjamites did not know this disaster was upon them. And the Lord, here it is, guys, the Lord defeated Benjamin before Israel. Whose battle was it? It was the Lord's battle. Because they had came them to the Lord the way God prescribed. And now the Lord defeats Benjamin. And then watch what it says. And the children of Israel destroyed that day 25,100 Benjamites, all these who drew the sword. Now, Gibeah was just one portion of Benjamin, but Benjamin 
sided with the men of Gibeah. And the consequence for doing so had come upon them. And here, here, here's, the, here's the reality, man. There's a consequence for sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you can choose to stand on the side of sin, but you're in the losing team. Just the way it is. You're on the losing team. Because God is going to win in the end. And he will come out the victor. It's already, it's already declared. It's already determined. He comes out the victor. Satan and all of his lies and all of those who are following those lies, man, they get defeated in the end. And this is just a picture of us. Incredible. They get wiped out. The children of Benjamin saw that they were defeated. The men of Israel had given ground to, to the Benjamites because they relied on the men of ambush whom they had set against Gibeah. And the men in ambush quickly rushed Gibeah. The men in ambush spread out, struck the whole city with the edge of the sword and it appointed signals between the men of Israel and the men of ambush, which they had, that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise from the city whereupon the men of Israel would turn to battle and Benjamin had begun to strike and kill about 30 of the men of Israel for they said surely they're defeated before us as in the first battle but when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke the Benjamites looked behind them and there was the whole city going up in smoke to heaven and when the men of Israel turned back the men of Benjamin panicked and they saw the disaster had come upon them therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel in the direction of the wilderness but but the battle overtook them and over and whoever came out of the city they destroyed in their midst they surrounded the benjamites chased them and easily trampled them down as far as the front of gibeah toward the east and 18,000 men of benjamin fell and there these were men of valor then they turned fled toward the, the wilderness of the rock of ribbon and they cut down 5,000 of them on the highway and they pursued them relentlessly up to Gibeon, up to Gibeon. They killed 2,000 of them. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor, but 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness of the rock of Rimmon and they stayed at the rock of Rimmon for months, for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin, struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beasts and all who were found. The, they set fire to all the cities that they came to. Wow. Long story. But what's, what's incredible is that they went now and what, what happens, man? They defeat the evil that was there. And those that were standing for evil. Now, chapter 21, and we're, we're going to take this quick. Next week, we're going to begin the book of Ruth. And one of the greatest love stories ever told. It's going to be a great change. <laughs> we don't see all this war and battle. We're going to, we get a love story. Ruth is an incredible love story, man. And so we'll, 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 get, um, we'll be in the book of Ruth for a couple of weeks it's a, a very short book, and then we'll start the book of First Samuel, man. Incredible, incredible. Now, chapter 21. The men of Israel had sworn an oath in Mizpah, saying, none of us shall give our daughter to Benjamin as a wife. The people came to the house of God, and they remained there before God till evening. And they lifted up their voices. They wept bitterly, and they said, oh, Lord God of Israel, why has this Come to pass in Israel that today there should be one tribe missing in Israel. Now, here's what's happening. Benjamin was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're mourning because their brethren had been wiped out. And so they're going, man, you know, what do we do now? I mean, we, we've wiped out, we've killed all of their, you know, all of their belongings and there's 600 men still alive. What are we going to do? How are they, how they going to, you know, regroup how are they going to regather again how are they going to rebuild again we're missing a tribe of the children of israel and so they come up with a plan the next morning that the people rose early they built an altar there they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings the children of israel said who is there among all the tribes of israel who did not come up with this with the assembly to the lord for they had made a great oath concerning anyone who had not come up to the lord at mizpah saying he shall surely be put to death. And the children of Israel grieved for Benjamin, their brother, 
And they said, one tribe is cut off from Israel today. What shall we do for their wives, for those who... Uh, what shall we do for wise for those who remain, seeing that we have sworn by the Lord that we will not give them our daughters as wives? And they said, one uh, is, is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah to the Lord. What one? And in fact, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly, for when the people were counted, Indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there, so the congregation sent out their 12,000 of their most valiant men, commanded them, saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children, and this is the thing that you'll do. You shall utterly destroy every male, every woman who has known a man intimately. So they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man intimately and they brought them to a camp in Shiloh which is in the land of Canaan. Now they, 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 let, me, let me just interject here. Guys, they're still not following the word of God. They, they're still not following the, the, the commandments that had been passed down to Moses. And so because of it, they're making one bad decision after another bad decision. They, they, they're now making oaths. You know, none of our daughters will marry a Benjamite. So they, 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 the Bible was clear. You're not to make a promise that you can't keep. You're not to make an oath to God like that. But they did it anyway. So now they're in a dilemma. We can't give them our wives. What are we going to do? We don't want Benjamin to be, you know, just totally wiped out. So what we'll do is we'll go kill these other guys and we'll give them their daughters. Again, I, I get rebelling against God's word again. And it's, it seems that, you know, once you start to make one bad choice and you're not going to submit your life to what God declares and then you're going to make the next bad choice and it just seems to be the cycle of bad choices that we make. Once you decide that I'm not going to do what God's declared in a relationship, then how, do, how is that relationship ever going to be on track with what God desired? Or in your life. Once you decide, hey, I, I'm not going to do what God says there, you know, you're going to make one bad choice after another bad choice. And that's what the children of, uh, of, of Israel were doing, man. They, because there was no one guiding or directing, no one was standing on the word of God. And so now they're just making bad choice after bad choice after bad choice. And it's incredible because you, you look at that, you know, even in, 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 you know, how many people today where, you know, they, they make a bad choice and then rather than repenting and going and say, you know what, I got to fix this before I, I can go forward. They just now continue to live from bad choice to bad choice to bad choice. Never, ever turning from what they had done in the past. And God's willing to forgive. That's, that's the amazing thing. But God isn't going to continue to allow you to be in rebellion and then expect God to bless that. He can't. And this whole story, man, it's it, it, it just, it just a sad state of a nation that had forsaken truth. Because even though they got one thing right, they didn't get the next thing right. And, and it, it seems to be that this, you know, same thing that happens in our lives. I mean, until we're really to come and say, God, I surrender. I surrender. I'm not going to do things my way anymore. I'm not going to do things what I think anymore. I'm not going to go by my feelings anymore. I'm not going to go what I perceive anymore. I want to live my life according to what you say is right so that then you can bless it. And then you can go before it. And then I can be walking in truth and in peace and in wisdom, rather than walking in error and walking in deception and walking in a lie. And so, man, we're, we're, we're really ran out of time. Read the rest of that chapter, guys. It, it just, more of the same. It was like, what in the world were these guys thinking? They're dumb, just like us. <laughs> but all that God was looking for was that they would just say, hey, okay, we're gonna start to do things right now. And you know, that, that's the cool thing, is that no matter how bad you mess it up, man, how far you walked away, it's just one step back and say, God, I've blown it. I made a mess of things, but I don't wanna live like that anymore. I wanna live according to truth. I wanna line my life up with 
you say is right. And the moment you do that, man, your life can now have a new beginning, a new start. That's why the Bible says that if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. All the old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's the cool thing, is that you can have a new start right now. It's just a matter of coming and saying, God, I don't want to do this wrong anymore. I don't want to live in rebelling anymore. I want to offer my life as a living sacrifice. And I want to live my life for you.